Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to introduce you to a really interesting gentleman, someone who I've known for about 20 years. And uh, this summer, he told me about uh, a life story that he has that I wasn't I wasn't aware of previously, and he's now published a book. It's actually coming out in French in France this week, and it's uh, called To Be or Not to Be Bipolar. Uh, bipolar. Uh, uh, my guest is uh, Pierre Jean, uh, federally known, commonly known as PJ, uh, Esmir right. Follet, uh, and he is a, uh, how did I do? Terrible? Not even close, but that's okay. Not even Let's close. go with PJ. And I actually took lots of French lessons. Unbelievable. Uh, but uh, PJ uh, is a very successful investment banker, um, a CFO in uh, Paris, France. Um, but he wanted to make sure that people were aware of uh, of his life story and, uh, and, 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 and how it's his impacted him. And I guess he wants to make, uh, make it something that people can can live with. Um, PJ, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. I'm so happy to be around with you guys. So tell me a little bit about your your life story. When did you find out that you were bipolar? Yeah, I uh, I did my, my university. It's a business school in France. The name is HEC. Arguably, it's the first uh, business school uh, in the world. And uh, there was there was a, a rule uh, at that time. I'm talking about 35 years ago when I graduated. Where you had to uh, to go uh, and and be trained and uh, uh, and go to uh, to to the army for for about a year. At that time, it was uh, it was compulsory. You had to do it once you were um, uh, finishing your school. And I decided to make money, so I decided to do something which was possible, which was to work for a subsidiary of a French group in South Africa. So I started my first job in South Africa as an investment banker. And uh, after a year, I got my first kid in South Africa in Johannesburg. And uh, my kid, my parents came over, uh, in particular my dad. Um, and I was awful. Uh, I treated them like, oh gosh, uh, like the worst dad on earth. Uh, because, well, it cheated on my on my, on my mother. and but, but I was so harsh on him. And, and really, I was a bad guy. So they stayed about two weeks with us. Uh, and then they came back to France. And... And I figure out when so we left at the airport with my dad and I said goodbye. I, I did a big hug because I, I was thinking something was going wrong with my mind because I was so bad. And it, frankly, he did not deserve that. He was, he was a great dad. So I said to him, hey, there's something wrong. We need to talk about it. I'm going back to France in two months uh, for, for the kid to, to see the family, which I did with my wife. And when we came over... Um, I said to him, hey, you got to talk to me about something because I know there's something wrong in the family, something that nobody wants to talk about. But I know there's something. I don't know what, but please tell me. Happened that my, my father is a doctor. So, uh, well, he took the, the right words to explain to me that obviously I inherited of the uh, gene uh, of the family, which is uh, bipolar, uh, which is um, a pathology, as you know. So what happened is that uh, I discovered that when I was 22 years old, um, so I went to a psychiatrist, took my pill, um, I don't know if you know, uh, Brian, but the pill that you take when you're bipolar is lithium, like, you know, the methyl that you put in the battery. So that's, right. that's what you, uh, well, what I took uh, one gram a day um, and, and, and it worked very well. Um, I had a fantastic career. Uh, then I went to the UK. I went to, um, to New York. I was hired by Goldman Sachs. Uh, the package was three million pounds uh, and, and I was 21, 29 years old. So everything was doing great. I took my pills and, and everything was fine. My, my, my family life also was great. Um, and then I uh, went back to France. Um, I, I met you at that time. I was the CFO of a, of a large biotech company in France. Everything was fine. There was a lot of stress, but I could, I could cope with it because I took my medicine. And 15 years later, that was in 2017, so that's about five years ago, uh, my psychiatrist had told me, hey, PJ, this is, this is amazing. You, you, you're treating yourself very well. Um, you, nobody can see that you're bipolar because you're taking your pills and you, you pay attention to, to um, your mood and how to, how to manage it. So everything was fine. And she said to me, hey, PJ, now we're going to address your uh, hyperactivity. Um, as you know, uh, and it's very common in the U.S., kids take uh, Ritalin. You know that, Ritalin, when they're young, when they show a TDAH, I think it's TDHA. Um, so... My doctor gave me okay. uh, Ritalin to address my hyperactivity. What happened? At, at, the, at the moment I took this pill, I'm talking 30 minutes after the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, consumption of, of the Ritalin, 
I went nuts. Uh, to make the story short, um, I, I came back to where I was when I was 23 years old. You remember in South Africa, I was just yep. a bad guy. So I became uh, just awful, uh, very bad decision business-wise. Um, very hopeful with my wife. I cheated on her. I, I went with a, a girl, 28 years old. I, I went on, on, on um, um, uh, I went out every evening, uh, coming back at five. Um, um, and frankly, my, my management of my, my company uh, was, was just a disaster. So um, um, it took me uh, about 18 months to recover because uh, needless to say that uh, I stopped the Ritalin, but, but I took it for three weeks. And these three weeks sufficed for me to become, as I was trying to explain, a different person, a bad person, uh, with little judgment, and, and above all, uh, the willingness to, to be the best, uh, to, uh, to, um, to act very badly with friends and foes and families and office within the office. Um, well, if you want something that happened to me uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, it was just a disaster. At that time, I had created um, a conglomerate, a small conglomerate of about 22 companies, uh, mostly in modeling and hostesses and also in engineering. It was uh, it was 700 people uh, company. Uh, I had 22 companies, as I said, and um, it was it was very profitable. 20% um, EBITDA, uh, very profitable. Uh, it was worth at that time when I took the retail in 2017. There was an independent valuation of my group. It was worth about 20 million euros, and I own about 100% of it. So it was a success what I had created over five years. But um, 18 months after, uh, I filed for Chapter 11. Uh, I lost the entire group. Uh, I had to liquidate the companies, the 22 companies. I had to fire 700 people. And I had to start from scratch, which I did uh, about uh, 18 months ago. So um, uh, it's easy to demonstrate with independent value, uh, expertise, expertise, medical expertise, uh, that it's pretty weird to have a very successful uh, entrepreneur uh, putting together a new group from scratch in five years and acting strangely uh, from the get-go on, on, on a very date, which was uh, the 10th of June 2017, the first day I took this retelling. And it just killed me. Uh, Two things that you will not believe, because I'm sure you think that France is a republic and a well-managed country. Still, uh, the retaliation that was given to me had no marketing authorization. I repeat, for, for adults, in 2017, you can check, it was pro prohibited to give retaliation to an adult in France. <clears throat> so that's amazing what happened to me. Um, the second thing, Things went so bad after about two months after I started to take the Ritalin that I, I was um, I was sent to the hospital against my will uh, in a place like uh, well a, a, a specialized unit you know for psychiatrists uh, intensive care um, so I was forbidden from doing anything possible like face giving a phone call or, or writing or or seeing someone, and all that lasted for 15 days. Um, and I was um, I was in this unit with with crazy people, and that was um, a very very difficult time for me. So as you can see, um, everything changed very very quickly. What an incredible story! Well, it just happened to be true. Um, you know, PJ, PJ, uh, PJ, we're going to take a break for a message. Uh, this is unbelievable. Okay. We're going to come back and talk more about this in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're having quite an interesting, um, really a fascinating conversation with uh, uh, PJ from France, uh, who's telling us his story of, uh, of finding out that he was bipolar, um, dealing with it with lithium for what sounds like 20, 30 years, and then uh, taking uh, being prescribed Ritalin um, and uh, and having uh, really quite a, a bad experience uh, and losing his company. And, uh, and, and, and I think you were going to launch into tell us a little bit more, but PJ... Let's just take a step back for a second, if if we could. So, so Ritalin did what? It it counter effect counter um, 
uh, impacted the uh, the effect of uh, the, the the lithium, or it it accentuated even more? Or what what do you think the the Ritalin actually did? Well, it, you know, of course, I, I've made a lot of studies on that. I I teamed up with different psychiatric uh, psychiatrist guy in France uh, in the US. But you you should never ever uh, prescribe Ritalin to a uh, bipolar taking is medicine, taking lithium. If you go into the literature, uh, you will find that the the effects of the two molecules are antagonists. So what you're trying to achieve with lithium is to make your mood more stable. But what you're trying to achieve with Ritalin is to get excited because, as you probably know, it's not far off from cocaine. Okay, I haven't never Ritalin is not far off from cocaine. No, it's not far. It's an opiacy. It, it's coming from morphine. Or it's a derivative deriv uh, of that. It's, it's, it's something that excites yourself uh, very much. And, and by the way, what's, what's fascinating with this molecule, um, and that's, the, that's why 10% of kids in the U.S. take Ritalin because their parents are too lazy to address the fact that they're a bit excited. And, and it, it gives a counter effect of, um, of what it would do to a, a quote-unquote normal kid. Because um, if you if your if your kid is very excited and, and is hyperactive, uh, if you give him Ritalin, it gives the opposite effect of the excitement of the cocaine. Now, if you are uh, a bipolar, it gives you the direct effect, which is the excitement. So you you it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the doctor gives you um, a, a lithium to stabilize your humor. In other words, instead of being like this in your day to day life. With lithium, you're like this, which is fine. That's what we're looking for. Now, if you add to this uh, a treatment of Ritalin, which is very strong on the brain, even if I took I took a, a medium dosage, I took 20 milligrams, which is which which is not nothing. But if you put Ritalin on top of it, you do, <laughs> and and it and it it fluctuates your mood, um, you fluctuates uh, two or three times more than it would without anything. So this was a very bad call from my psychiatrist, um, but um, you you may you may wonder why I never tell I never told you that I was bipolar. You, you never did. Think? We know why, we knew each other for not? years. Even worse, I, as I said, um, I went to the uh, court, um, the, the, the the business court uh, of France of Paris, uh, but but when you file for twenty two. <laughs> 22 chapter 11 file, if you wish. Basically, you, you, you're going to spend two years and a half and you go to the court about once a week. So I saw the, the judges so many times, I never, ever mentioned the fact that I was quote-unquote crazy. I never, ever, even though I had this backup with uh, this, uh, this medicine that I should not have taken. The reason why I did not, because we're in France. If I had been uh, in New York, where uh, I experienced some friends who were, who were bipolar, I would have said it from the get-go. I did not say so in France because we have um, we we all think that psychiatrist uh, disease um, are in a way worse than a cancer. Um, we we have a say in France, which is um, when you have a psychiatric a psychiatric disease, uh, there is a, a, a double um, uh, judgment. The, the, a double a sanction, a double sanction. The first sanction, when you're bipolar, you suffer. You suffer because, of course, you even though you're excited, you, you feel what's going on. And, and when you sleep, you don't sleep very well. Actually, you, you don't sleep. You hardly sleep, by the way, when you're really excited. But uh, you, you, you do feel that something is going wrong. You do feel that you, your folks, your friends are, are getting away from you and, and everything is going wrong. And, and, and even though you, you poorly manage your company, although you, you create it from scratch and you made a success, and, and, and within three weeks, it becomes a disaster. Uh, in, in order to do that, you really need to change everything. Now, what happened in France, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's a given, I'm sure about this. That's why I decided not to say anything up to now. We have the double sanction. So the first sanction is I, I'm, I have the pathology. I suffer from it. Okay, but I think it's, it's easy to understand. The second sanction is the judgment of the French guy uh, that will look into my situation, that will see me when I was crazy, and they will they will not um, uh, co uh, communicate. Uh, they, they will not share my pain at all. They will have a judgment, a sanction of judgment, and they will um, uh, consider that I'm crazy. And as a result. Something very, very dangerous is happening to me now because I went open. I, I did, if I, if I can say it, 
I did my coming out uh, to the court uh, a, a month ago because I decided to change my line of uh, defense. Uh, because, of course, uh, I, not only have I've lost everything, but I owe to the state and uh, to the banks, because I was very leveraged, uh, I owe 28 million euros. So, so now the you state owe 28 million euros. Yeah, yeah. You know, you never trust me when, when I said to you, when we started our relationship, and I said to you, I can leverage your company, I can leverage BioVell and find debt, bank debt, cheap, long, uh, with no covenant. Well, that's what I did. I, I raised uh, in excess of uh, 20, 25 million euros of financial debt with no equity. And that was LBO. So imagine an LBO without equity. That, that's what I did for five years. And it was very successful because my, my end leverage was 2.5, which is, which is, which is okay. But um, my main point is that um, the judgment uh, from French guys uh, about pathology on, on your brain, if you wish, in general, is, is awful. You, you, you'd rather have a cancer, really. In France, really? you'd rather have a cancer. So, you know, living with and, and, and mental health issues have become really, you know, something that uh, have been been talked about uh, in the last couple of years in Canada, the United States and, and accepted. And, and there's been a, a fair amount of uh, discussion about uh, about uh, being OK with it. And you're saying that is not uh, at all um, what 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 exists in France. Well, I have a testimony of what I'm saying. So I, I took my risk basically because now now I'm open. I, I'm naked to the, to the court because I'm changing my 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 my, my line of defense. So I, I, I'd better be right because if I'm wrong, they're gonna prohibit me uh, to to run a company. So th that's very risky what I did. But I decided to do so, and I might I might have been wrong because when I when I did my my coming out to the court months ago, uh, the, the president of the court once he. He, he heard about the testimony, the, the expertise from a psychiatrist, independent psychiatrist, et cetera. Uh, his, his, his preliminary conclusion was, hey, we understand you're probably not responsible for what happened, which is good, but uh, we're going to put you, uh, would, would, it be, uh, would it be acceptable to put you on tutel? I don't know what's the translation of tutel. Tutel is where basically you can't decide anything. Uh, the court will nominate somebody that will make all your decision, even your day-to-day -day decision. In other words, you don't have a business card, um, you don't have a credit card, you don't have a bank account, and you can't sign anything. So, um, of course, uh, I said no. Uh, but you see, the, the response immediately is, well, PJ, there was something wrong with you. As a result, there could be something wrong in the future, and we need to protect the others from your potential uh, recidive, your potential second um, problem going forward. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight so much on that. I'm so pleased to coming out on your, it's the first time I speak to it uh, about it uh, outside of court. But uh, of course, I, 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 I thought a lot about this uh, attitude and, and I'm sure I'm right, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be real tough and, and I better be right. Unbelievable story. Uh, PJ, why did you uh, write this book and publish this book? I published this book because, um, to me, um, you can't understand what happened if you, if you, if you don't understand where I come from. Where I come from. For instance, uh, it, it, one side of the explanation, something very important, I guess, is to explain that I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been very successful as an entrepreneur or as an investment banker, and then it doesn't make any sense for me to turn into a bad entrepreneur within one day. So something wrong happened. Just just to make you laugh. I, 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 we never talked about it, Brian, but it makes me laugh so much. When I was five years old, uh, we were in the, on the Mediterranean coast uh, at my parents' home, um, uh, about about uh, about 600 miles south of Paris. And I was so bored uh, being on the beach with the others. So I created my first business. I, I went to the uh, pine wood and I collected cones in the morning. And then I went, uh, there was there was a street where everybody was walking. Was, and so I, I went with a hammer and, and the cones. I took a lot of cones. And you know, I, I opened them and I extracted the small pine, which is very valuable. It's very expensive. And I made uh, little bags of 100 grams and I sold it um, when I was fine. The business went out very well. Uh, I was making about 20 francs, <laughs> which will be $20 as we speak now. Uh, back to, well, that's 50, well, four, 49 years ago. 
But it worked so much that all my friends on the beach stopped playing with stands or whatever or swimming and, and went and helped me. So I had my own business. We were 10 doing so. The problem is that my mother came to me and said, PJ, we, we're giving you food. Uh, we're paying you school of tennis. Uh, how come you need money? I said, well, I don't know. I love it. And uh, that's what we did. Uh, and then I, I created another business uh, because sometimes it was raining. So it was difficult because there was nobody to, to sell our pine to. So, so I collected uh, snails uh, uh, around uh, close to the beach. And, and, and again, I was selling that to restaurants. Uh, by. So I think it's useful to read the book because you got all these stories that I found, well, quite funny. Um, and let the, the, the reader understand where I come from. And 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 you're you're trying to tell your story, but are you trying to to do something in regards to people's acceptance of uh, bipolar disease or mental health or something as well? Um, my plan is to um, to give uh, freely uh, about 100 copies of my book to uh, lead um, bipolar psychiatrists uh, in France, including um, a, a European center, which is in you probably know La Défense, which is the, the business center west of Paris. Yes. So very close to that, just a little bit west, uh, more west. Uh, that's about I don't know five miles from Paris. There is the uh, the, the European Center for Bipolar, uh, which is based in in Corbeau, close to this part of uh, outside of Paris. And uh, I, I took a commitment when when I lost everything in 2017 uh, for that not to happen again. So on top of uh, being followed by a psychiatrist on a monthly basis, I also go every six months, every year at Defense, um, and I do a full check, which is about half a day. And they check everything out to to see what I'm doing crazy. So I want also to uh, give them free copy, talk to the psychiatrists uh, all around in France, about a hundred of them, um, and for them then to um, to to, uh, to to make my story known uh, to other guys because there's a way out, but it's the situation is so bad in France when you have something wrong with your brain. Again, uh, I wish I had a cancer. Well, I'm glad you don't have cancer, frankly, because uh, you're a great guy, and I'm very sorry to hear this whole story, but. You know, it's, it's. Don't, don't. What, I, I came out, uh, you know what? Never go back. You know that? Never go back. I, I've lost my wife. I've lost my three boys. Well, they're starting to come back now, but it, it's tough. I've lost, well, 20 million euros. I've created a, a liability of 28 and I've got no asset, but li life is fantastic. I, I found out Delphine, she's my second wife. Uh, about four years, uh, four and a half years ago, she's taking care of me uh, financially because I, I'm, I, I'm stressed. I got nothing, um, and that allowed me to get a great two years old boy, which is just it's it's fantastic. I love it so much. And secondly, um, I've created a new investment bank from scratch with my name on it, uh, Fornell Advisory, and we were so successful. It's, it's unbelievable. That's why also I'm fighting with the court because I've created something which is worth a lot of money and a lot of, um, well, I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's, it's amazing what we're doing. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to lose that. I don't want now, to lose in, that. In, uh, in America, what you described, the court was, uh, was threatening with, uh, I think it's called a conservatorship um, where someone uh, has the Maybe. rights, uh, you know, all the financial rights and, and a lot of other rights. Uh, uh, Britney Spears was actually uh, under a conservatorship. Um, is that a real possibility? No, it doesn't make any sense because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm now, I think I, I, I'm about to collect the third expertise on what happened. The first two, uh, the first one is from a leading psychiatrist in, he's the youngest um, head of service um, uh, at, at, at the most famous hospital for all brain problems in France, in, in Paris. It's, it's the hospital of Saint Anne for the one that knows it. Uh, so this guy is prominent. Uh, his expertise is, is, is very conclusive. Uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of risks. Because, uh, it is very, very clear in its conclusion. He's, he's saying three things rapidly. Number one, PJ has never, ever been crazy until uh, uh, 2017 when he took the Ritalin. Number two, uh, PJ was completely crazy for 18 months after he took the Ritalin. Number three, uh, ever since, PJ has run his business very professionally, very, very lucratively. Um, and he has an attitude with uh, with others in general, business, private, which which is fine. I did another thing to to improve uh, the the, the situ well, situation, well situation, to, to to make it simpler to everyone. I collected fifty eight independent um, testimony 
which I put together in a book of 300 pages, which I just gave yesterday to the court. So I'm putting so much information, it's got to work. PJ uh, Fornell is uh, is telling us about his um, his story, his life story with uh, living with uh, bipolar disease. <clears throat> How uh, when he took uh, some uh, some Ritalin uh, in combination with the lithium that he was prescribed uh, since he was uh, twenty something years old, uh, he ended up uh, going on a on a, a real I don't know what you call it a bender a crazy uh, uh, interlude uh, for eighteen months and uh, he lost everything and now he's trying to get everything back. Uh, and he's uh, recently published a book about uh, his uh, life with bipolar. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back in just two minutes with PJ Fornell. Stay with us. <clears throat> Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with uh, uh, Pierre-Jean uh, Fornell, PJ for short. Uh, he's uh, someone I know in Paris, France, uh, and he's written a book uh, about uh, to be or not to be bipolar. Uh, um, it's in French. Um, and he's uh, publishing it this week, and he really wants to come out in regards to his bipolar disease and something that happened when uh, the lithium that he was prescribed when he was a young man, um, he ended up being counteracted by a prescription, um, I guess, just a couple of years ago uh, for uh, for Ritalin that he took, and he's suggesting that Ritalin not only counteracted the lithium, lithium, but actually accentuated his uh, his bipolar disease. PJ, let's take a step back uh, for a second, if I could. So, you said that your doctor, your 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 father, who was a doctor, told you when you were in your early twenties that that bipolar disease is is genetic and it's something that runs in your family. Is that correct? That's completely correct. We can go up to the fifth generation, and the good news is that if you start with the fifth generation, which will be my grand 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 father. Uh, it was completely crazy. He was he was in hospital all all day long, couldn't get out of it. Uh, then, well, the fourth one was but not as 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 important, etc. So, uh, but still, uh, dad was had a stronger uh, um, presentation of the disease. Um, he, he he was electrocuted uh, three times. Uh, yeah, in the seventies. Huh? It's not it's not in the nineteenth century. So he was electrocuted three times. Um, he had a lot of depression during his life, uh, heavy depression, not suicidal, suicidal, suicidal but close. And uh, the problem with that is that he, he, he had a version of uh, of uh, bipolar, which was, uh, I'm, as I'm trying to explain, a bit stronger than mine. But he, he wouldn't take really the medicine. He, he was not very uh, obedient on, on the medicine. Do, do you know why, Brian, uh, uh, bipolar don't want to take the lithium? Do you no, know why? 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 Well, they don't do it, although it works very well. It's a very good medicine. It's We've got about 100 years of track. Well, bipolar don't take lithium for a simple reason. Uh, it drives you down in terms of potency, in terms of power, in terms of intellect. You're slower. So you know that if you take lithium, you're not going to be as clever as you could be. That's why a lot of them, don't, a lot of patients don't take it. Really, that's interesting. And and so, what did your I I haven't heard about this electrocution. So so he did he get get this done voluntarily, or was this something that was prescribed for him, or what? Right, uh, it, it was prescribed. Uh, it was <laughs> it was reimbursed. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it worked out pretty well because well, it, it happens again uh, these days. Um, in some instances, uh, a psychiatrist would recommend even now in the 2023, 22. Uh, it would happen, but it's very scarce now. And, and did he take any drugs? Did he take lithium? Yeah, he had the same um, the same um, active principle, same API. Now, the name of the medicine is uh, Teralit, for those who cares about the name. It's Teralit, but, uh, but again, it's 100% lithium. Now, um, he obviously had this bipolar disease. He knew that his uh, his forefathers did. Why didn't he warn you? Did you not uh, exhibit any uh, um, traits of it uh, when you were a teenager or, or what? Uh, I, I love it. Um, he told me so uh, reluctantly because um, him and, and mom, mom has no disease at all, um, mama and, and, and papa. But papa was so reluctant because it, it, it was like it was his fault, if you see what I mean. Although he's got nothing to do with it, but genetically, yes, it was coming from him. So 
he, he could not, he, he didn't want to, me to suffer as much as he did due to this uh, pathology. Other than the fact that you were this uh, unbelievable entrepreneur on the beaches when you were a kid, did you have, um, you know, bipolar traits when you were a child or a teenager? No, it's something usually that comes out. Well, it's mostly for men, uh, by the way. It's about a ratio of nine to one. When you do a nine, nine will be for, for men and one for, 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 for women. And uh, it, it happens most of the time just after teenagers. So, so it will be when, you, when you're between 17 and 25 years old, roughly. That's when the, uh, the, the pathology will come out. Really? I didn't know that. And, and then, then it reduces. And then it reduces when you started your 60s, 65 years old. Um, and tell me, you know, when you went through this 18 months, what did you do? <laughs> okay. I need people to listen to me and, and be very, um, and we show a lot of empathy. Yeah? For, for instance, um, I, I decided, um, well, at the same time, Brian, um, I was successful, but I had initiated the process a uh, long time before. But I, I closed just after the Ritalin. So a week, uh, sorry, three weeks after, I closed um, uh, an increase in equity. I raised about 5.2 million. So basically, when, when I started to be crazy, uh, I had uh, tons of money in cash uh, in the group. And I, I decided to acquire, to acquire a company with, uh, it was a digital uh, company. You, it's just uh, appalling. Um, we're talking one million in sales. We're talking zero EBITDA, um, uh, poorly managed, uh, no portfolio, no no clients. Well, I, I wrote a check of uh, one million forty thousand uh, euros uh, in one shot, uh, and of course it was worth zero. So that's the kind of thing I could. So you also, made bad decisions. Decided, is what you're saying? Right? You made bad decisions. Well, yeah, another one. I decided to acquire a, a, a building in Paris. Um, the guy, the, the vendor, uh, was put, putting a lot of pressure on me and said, hey, PJ, I'm not sure you got the money, so uh, give me um, uh, 200000 up front, and that will secure the transaction that will lead you two miles. I did. I gave him 200 Of course, I never raised the rest, so I lost 200 etc., etc., etc. But it was very difficult to, to run a company because uh, do you have two minutes for something huge? Yes. Okay. I told you I was in turn uh, without my will, without my consent, by um, uh, a special unit of psychiatrists. Like, you know, the, the, the movie with uh, Nicholson, uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, um, Fly Over a Cuckoo Nest, you know? One, one so, Fly Over the Cuckoo Nest, something like that. Yeah. So I was in an intensive care uh, hotel, uh, hospital without my uh, approval. And the reason why I was sent is just very tricky, but I need your full attention. Um, I acquired a modeling agency a long time ago, and 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 the director was was a she, and her name was very very close to uh, Lisa Ingalls. She was Melissa Ingalls, so her name was very close to Lisa Ingalls. Do you know who, who is Lisa Ingalls? No, I do not. You should. Okay. This is this is the main important feature in the little house in the Valley or the Prairie. This, this is the main um, series um, uh, in, in, in American uh, history with Michael London as a producer, as a director, as an actor. Okay. Well, anyways, um, there is no story. There's about 200 episodes. It's very well known, Brian, very well known. Little House on the Prairie, yes. Yeah, there's 200 episodes and, and every episode lasts 25 minutes and there's nothing. The scenario is nothing. There's nothing happened. And at the end, Michael London, the father, take an, an ax and he cut wood, okay? So that's the end of the story every time. So what I did, I went with one of my friend in the countryside and came back on the morning morning, and I put on a desk um, uh, in terms of feet, that's a five feet ax on her desk. And I said to her, uh, feel free, use it, and, and go and, and cut some wood. But everybody laughed. It was, it was supposed to be funny. You should, you should, you should. It was very funny. So my secretaries took the axe when when the joke was over, and they put the axe back to my uh, to in my uh, in my office. It, it was 10 a.m. in the morning. At 3 p.m., I had five cops with AK-47, uh, arm ja jacket, everything, uh, with two psychiatrists, my wife, two kids, my father-in-law, my cousin, etc. 25 persons in my office. 
And that's why they decided to give me this intensive care situation without my will, because I was they were afraid that I would kill people with the axe. That's what happened. Oh my God. So it all started like this. So how do you want to run a business when you come back from an intensive care? Uh, all your directors, all your employees, I've seen you with, you know, cufflinks from the uh, the cops, the cops, uh, not cufflinks, um, how do you call it? Handcuffs. Handcuffs. So, yeah, the, the cops put me the handcuffs. So you can <clears throat> imagine, try to restart the company when you come back from the intensive care. It was impossible. It, on top of it, uh, every single night after 10 p.m., I was going to nightclub until 5. I, I I didn't sleep at all. I, I was crazy all day long. You went to nightclubs every single night? Yeah, the same one, which is close to the um, Elysee. The, you know, that's where our president here is in the in the 8th arrondissement in Paris, in the center of Paris. So I went to this place, I don't know, maybe 200 times in uh, in a year and a half, spending money, by the way, because I was spending so much money. Wow. Now, some people would think that, you know, going to a nightclub every night would be fun. <laughs> but the problem is that I don't know how to dance and I didn't make any progress at all. So even though I, I, I was trying everything, I was trying Tinder, I was trying to dance in nightclubs, that wouldn't work. I couldn't get uh, girls to, to follow me, uh, probably because I looked crazy. And and during this time, you also, you said you lost your wife and you lost your kids? Yeah, my, my wife uh, decided to file for divorce, um, and I I have nothing to say against that because I was just uh, it was impossible to live with me. Um, and uh, yeah, my my three kids have been told that um, because nobody understands in the family what happened because it, they all think that hey, has PJ was making um, as I said three point five million pounds uh, in in ninety eight uh, one million dollars just before in the US. Uh, if he farm, I was making some money close to a million. Um, Everybody say, well, it's not possible. PJ is so a successful entrepreneur, a successful investment banker, credited from the, the best business school. Oh, I didn't tell you, I ranked number one in the business school in finance, uh, which was huge. Uh, so they, they all think that I have hidden accounts in the Cayman, um, in Switzerland, uh, whatever. So every time I go to, well, when I don't go to court for, um, for, for, the, for my group, uh, at the Court of Commerce, I go to uh, the court for divorce, and, and it was every six months. I, I'm just, I'm nearly finished with this, but it, it was uh, painful. And every time uh, the, the, the lawyer from my the other side, from my wife's side, is saying, hey, PJ has money because he, he made so much money in the past, it's impossible that he has lost everything. So I have to fight against this. I was proven right uh, two months ago with the preliminary decision, which was in my favor. Of course, because there's nothing. I've been audited by the state uh, in terms of tax situation, of course, because I came from a couple of million per annum to zero. Um, so everybody, um, yeah, people have doubts about it. And 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 yet, PJ, you're you're still standing. You're still alive. You're still doing well. Um, I, I love, I love so much gotta, my life. You've got a I new life. Kid. I love my kid. I, I, I won't give you uh, pictures. Well, I will uh, off uh, of this uh, interview, but uh, he, he's very he's very cute. Uh, and, and again, starting from zero, 18 months ago, I have, I'll tell you what, I have 17 mandates signed. Uh, the average fee on my mandate is half a mil. So, you know, um, I'm doing very well. Well, that's great to hear. Um, what a what an incredible story. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Delphin. About what, sorry? The, your new wife. Tell me a little bit about her. Ah, that's you, you got a problem with French in general, huh? I, mean, I need to help you out on that, huh? Yes, you Delphine. do. Delphine is... Uh, Delphine. Very pretty. Very pretty. Um, uh, she's a bit younger than I am. She's 11 years younger. Uh, she... We... we, You know, when, when I recovered, uh, so as I said, about the end of 98, uh, 2018, sorry, um, I... I went on Tinder. I went on Tinder. I used Tinder, and I put my face, my <laughs> funny face, and 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 it was written uh, managing director of uh, modeling agency. So of course that was a, a good approach to get girls interested. And I, 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 for uh, for about yeah for two weeks in a row, every single evening I had a rendezvous with a charming girl younger than mine, uh, uh, most of the time entrepreneur. Um, so that went out pretty well, but. I couldn't, 
I couldn't move forward. So we had this dinner, it was every time, and or a drink, and I couldn't do anything else. I, I was not interested. And then the 15th rendezvous was with Dolphin, and about two weeks after, we lived together. And we decided to have a kid about two months after. I did something Two weeks weird. after you started living together, and two no, months no, later, no. you had a kid. No, no. You decided decide to have a child. Kid. You remember it takes about nine months. You remember? I, I remember that was a while ago. What a what an incredibly wonderful story. We're going to take a break um, and come yeah. back with some concluding comments on uh, PJ's story <laughs> uh, with uh, with bipolar disease, his challenges, but uh, now that he wants to really um, come out and talk about it uh, and raise awareness of mental health issues. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to um, thank uh, PJ uh, Fornell for uh, sharing with us his story and his book that he's just uh, published uh, about uh, living with bipolar disease and uh, and talking really about mental health and, and some challenges, huge challenges, massive challenges that uh, um, you've had, PJ, and that, uh, you know, some people have. Um, tell me, you know, clearly what you want to do is come out yourself but but you're obviously also wanting to change attitudes toward uh mental health um if if someone in their 20s some guy in their 20s came to you and said that they had bipolar disease what advice would you give them thank your f you i would say the rest pill <laughs> take your pill because the downside um the, the the immediate effect as i try to explain if you don't take your pill you get excited and and everybody loves to be excited Everybody loves that. Uh, I'm going to talk to you like you're shit. I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to be more cl I'm clever than you or whatever. I'm, go I'm going to be very excited on sex. If you don't take your pill, your sex is very active. Your sexology, your your, your attitude is having sex. You, you, you want more. So, of course, it, it, can you imagine a male in the 40s, in the 50s, to reduce his sex life because he takes a pill? It takes a challenge. That's why, as I say, most of bipolar don't take their pills. Sex, money, power. All that is limited when you take your pill. When when you're in in the in the manic stage, but then obviously you you get into a depressive stage. What what are the downs like uh, in a for a bipolar person? Well, it depends on. Um, well, first uh, it's about the environment. Of, uh, I'd say because you, 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 your your brain may uh, may move up and down in terms of depression and excitement, but that's one thing. That's the chemical part. There's another thing, which is the environment. So, for instance, I don't know, you're on a big transaction, lot of money involved. Well, you're going to get excited by, by outside of your brain, and it will multiplicate your, ex your excitement within your brain. So it's a conjunction of your, your chemical situation, which is something you cannot manage. That's why you need your, your pill. And the second is the, uh, the outside. So, of course, there's also, uh, once you're bipolar, you got to, Pay attention, and and when the environment gets tricky for you, a lot of pressure, whatever, you, you you should just step back, and maybe for instance, don't go to a to work one day or or, or sleep a, 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 not not too late, this kind of thing. So all this kind of thing, a, a psychiatrist specialized in this pathology will explain very well. But, but the key elements about the uh, the medicine, what you do in general is two medicine are, are simplified. But there is one which is the the lithium, which is the main component of your therapy. But the second one is a, a, a thermal regulator. Uh, there's about three of them on the market. They work very well, and it gives you the ability not only to be like this, but maybe like this, which really? is great. So calm yeah. down and be more uh, level. Um, and, and so if uh, you wanted to, if you had an opportunity to speak to people generally about how they should uh, think about mental health issues, particularly bi bipolar disease, but other mental health issues as well, what, what's the message you want to del deliver to people? The principal message, uh, Brian, is that we talked about a disease, but we, we made a, a huge mistake. It is not a disease by, by far. It is a pathology. And once, if it's not revealed, it's it's not a disease. Um, I could make a, a comparison with HIV and AIDS. You can have HIV, but it leads to nothing in your, in your body until and if it transfers into AIDS. So it's exactly the same. So if you have just a pathology, after all, you, you, you may never know that you have it because it has no impact on you. It's only when the pathology reveals and transforms into a disease. So it's very difficult to, to assess and you need a very good psychiatrist, which is not that often. 
PJ, it's great to check in with you. Um, and I'm glad, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm glad things are going well for you today with your new wife and your your child. And <clears throat> I hope things go well with you in court. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you in business again. It will be a delight. <laughs> That's our show for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I do think that um, having people like PJ that are willing to tell us a little bit more about their uh, their life story uh, with uh, with mental health uh, issues, um, how it's challenged them, um, and how they've been able to get through it, uh, and how they need to take the drugs, uh, and they need the support from family and friends, etc., business associates uh, as well. I think is really helpful. Uh, and so thank you very much, PJ, for sharing. And thank you, everyone else, for uh, for listening to PJ's story. And good luck with the book. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you can hear me every night on 9.60 a.m. at 6 p.m. And you can stream me online, even from Paris, France, which I guess would be midnight your time, uh, at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody. <laughs>